Welcome again to Dust Jacket, Memoria College's podcast on books and learning. I'm joined again today by Memoria College professor of philosophy and my colleague, Dan Scheffler, and we're going to be talking today about Amor Toll's novel, Gentleman in Moscow. If you've read the book, that's great. I think you'll enjoy the discussion about the deeper elements of this story. If you haven't read it, that's fine too. We hope you'll be convinced that it's very much worth spending some time reading it. I consider it one of the great modern novels. We'll see if Professor Scheffler agrees with me on that. If he doesn't, you may not see him again on the podcast. So, Dan, did you like this book as much as I did? I think I liked this uh, bo- book much better than you, oh, okay. you did. Well, I, I adore uh, this book. I, I think it was uh, a very good read, extremely enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is uh, this is a book uh, by Amor Tolls. Uh, he's written some other books. He wrote Rules of Civility, which is about New York in the 1930s that just totally takes you there. Uh, and uh, The Lincoln Highway uh, as well, which is his last book. Both those books are have this really ev- events, this ability that Tolls has to cr- to bring you into another world. The, the rules of civility, uh, I don't know how he is able, I mean, in little things. He, he knows little things in this book that are all over the place, and you, you're reading it, and you're thinking, how does he know this? How does he know that that's the way it was in 1930s New York? And, of course, the reader doesn't know either, but it's so utterly convincing. And, and, and every little thing he does, every little thing he says uh, works to the benefit of— Really, the reader bringing that reader into that world. The Lincoln Highway is about um, about a some boys who are on basically a road trip, uh, going the opposite direction in which they intended to go. We'll be talking about that book at some point later on another show. But he does the same thing there. It takes place in 1950s Mid America, Nebraska, and then New York. And again, he does the same thing he always does, which is to bring you into a world. And, and in Gentlemen in Moscow, you've got a third, just entirely different world that he can't possibly know too much about because he's living so much later than the events he At relates. least not directly. I, I, I forget where I read this, but uh, you know somebody was was bu- bugging him. Hey, when's your next book going to come out? Mm-hmm. He said, well, it takes me a long time to write these books because I have to do a lot of research. Yes. And each of these books, you can tell, is researched the the names and the places and the specifics mm-hmm. and uh, just little nuances uh, about the culture and the in- inflections of the way that people talk to each other and, and interact. Um, just masterfully done. It's very evident. Uh, so, so as w- if we could start then talking about the setting. What is the setting in this book? Well, okay. So I have to say right at, at, at the outset that there's a plot twist at the end, and we don't want to give any spoilers to our listeners that, that right. uh, we, we want to talk about this, this book um, without ruining the experience right. for you. So, Well, um, and let me but, say, let me say, it was a good time to say it, is that we, uh, we are talking both to people who've read the book and people who have not read the book and I think that what we will have to say here, we have this very much in mind, we were talking about it before the show, that we want to be able to inspire people to read this book because I do think really it is really one of the modern classics. Which is what and dust jackets are for. They're this, supposed to get you to this, go buy the book and go read it. That's, that's right. absolutely right. So so continue. Right. So th- I, I bring that up because in laying out the very premise of the book, it involves this plot twist. And there's one key piece that right from the very beginning uh, you find out actually is not true. Uh, So one of the things that I'm about to say is not true, but you won't know which it is until you you read the book. Uh, So the story follows uh, Count Rostov, Alexei Rostov, uh, who um, is part of the Russian aristocracy uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, right when the Bolsheviks come to power in uh, 1917. And he had been sent abroad uh, for a sin of his youth, but he comes back to Russia even knowing that things are falling apart. Uh, And it's 
part of the story unfolding. Why why did he do that? Why didn't he just stay abroad? He could have had a nice life in France. Um, but he comes back. And right at the very beginning, we, the story opens with his trial, uh, where the Soviets uh, say, look, we have been in a habit of executing people of your class with your background, uh, but you, you wrote a poem long ago when you were young that has inspired many in the revolution and seems to have some kind of love for your your country and is is worthwhile. And so because of this poem, we'll have mercy on you and simply put you under house arrest. And the the poem apparently had some things in it that were consonant with the revolutionary agenda. Right, right, right exactly. It had, Which we don't see in... In, in raw stuff, in necessarily, yes, in yeah. Um, so where he's been living uh, is not in his home uh, estate. He had kind of settled that and brought just a few possessions from that uh, estate. And he's been living permanently in this luxury hotel, the Metropole Hotel in downtown this is Moscow. His prison. This is his prison. And th- because that he's placed under house arrest there, uh, he th- this becomes his, his prison. He's confined to the premises of this hotel. And the story unfolds from there. One of the things that that I love about it is um, that it it traces his whole life. So one thing to say right away is that it's not just a story of a single year, uh, but traces his, from that beginning point as a young man being put under house arrest in this hotel, follows him all the way. He's there for decades. For, for decades. Yeah. And so you see, it's a story about him, but it's also a story about Russia uh, during that time period. Well, I suppose there are worse things than being confined to a luxury <laughs> hotel, uh, although that would get tiresome after a while. Wait, we we is, were joking about this earlier, <laughs> that, that he compares himself to Robinson Caruso. Yes. yes. You know, and there's a little, there's a humorous irony <laughs> there that, yes, Robinson Caruso, if he were in a luxury hotel with fine dining and a stash of gold. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I thought that comparison was very interesting because I – and I read Robinson Crusoe only recently, really. And what struck me about that book and the character was how he – what does he do on the island? I mean, he, 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 he's trapped there. He, he spends some time taking things off the ship that he can use there by himself having to, to – uh, to survive, what does he do? He tries to recreate his own civilization mm. and maintain, mm-hmm. maintain maybe his own, a, a, sort of, he, he creates a little English outpost. Mm-hmm. He tries to recreate the English life. Right. So I think that that comparison is very apropos because uh, I'm thinking that that's what you're going to see in this book is that the civilization is very important. There's There's various ways in which he tries to preserve the civilization of pre-revolutionary Russia, right? So, um, so the the he says at the beginning of the book, um, he says when the count's parents succumbed to cholera within hours of each other in 1900, his parents uh, died of cholera. It was the Grand Duke who took the young count aside and explained that he must be strong for his sister's sake. That adversity, that adversity presents itself in many forms, and then if a man does not master his circumstances, then he is bound to be mastered by them. And this is repeated several times later. What what bearing does that have on on the book? What does he do with his circumstances? Well, so he he's put under house arrest, and so his his circumstances are pressing him, but he has this. Uh, way of preserving all the little elements of civility and uh, what it means to be a gentleman, Uh, the way he keeps his hair cut and the way that he uh, keeps uh, enjoying his his food, the way that he uh, arranges what little furniture he's able to have up in his 
his garret uh, loft that they that they throw him into. Uh, the way that he maintains his his reading and his 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 way of life, that he takes those circumstances and preserves some bastion of civilization, as as you were just describing. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm reminded of this uh, comment by by Roger Scruton, where he says that uh, beautiful things take thousands of of years to build and civilization culture uh, is layer upon layer of generation after generation building these these things that make life uh noble and yet they can be destroyed in an instant a single bomb uh, a single ideological revolution where the philistines come and sweep away everything with their their idiocy you know and so what i see him doing is Preserve, preserving what's worth preserving in the midst of that uh, that storm right. and doing the hard work to, <laughs> to keep it alive. And he's not doing this alone. There are several characters in this book, and two of them in particular, who help him in this effort to, to preserve civilization in the midst of revolution that's going on outside the hotel. Uh, who are they? Uh, well, there, there's a whole cast of of characters, the staff of of the hotel that are just delightful. Mm-hmm. The way that they uh, so you, you have this the staff first. So you've you've got the concierge who somehow magically knows where mm-hmm. where everybody is, mm-hmm. and you've got the uh, the maitre d at uh, Andre the, Andre at, at the the restaurant there, and the chef uh, Emile, Emile. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the three of them, the count. And Andre and Emile uh, form what they call the triumvirate. Yeah. Uh, that that they're the ones that are keeping civilization uh, together. Because the manager of the hotel, uh, after a while, mm-hmm. actually start the this this character called the bishop. Yes, uh, ironic. Why do they call him the bishop? He at first. Where does he encounter him first? Well, in the beginning, uh, that he's he's a mere waiter who's starting new but doesn't actually know the fine points of being mm-hmm. a good waiter. And at the very beginning, he takes offense because the count corrects one of his wine recommendations. Yeah. And this is after we should point out that there's actually two restaurants in his hotel. And one is sort of the the, the, the proletarian restaurant, uh, if you could say that about a luxury hotel. Still What's the cafe? Yeah, yeah, Piazza. They call it the yeah. Piazza. And then— and then there is a luxury restaurant called the Boyarski, and where he first meets the bishop, he and he calls him a bishop because of, he says his ecclesiastical manner. <laughs> uh, and so, so he meets the bishop first in the piazza, and then one day later on in, in the story, he shows up at the, at the as a waiter at the Boyarski. Oh. He's not a very good waiter even in the piazza, and somehow uh-huh. he gets in the boy into the Boyarski and. Talk about that more, but okay. right, and the, the so the count uh, sort of corrects a wine recommendation, and this point of offense becomes the ground of this grudge that that the bishop has uh, towards the count. But really, he bears grudges towards everybody else in the hotel, and is sort of the consummate uh, communist Soviet uh, because he's. Using he, he uses his political connections to progressively get promotions in the hotel, and mm-hmm. he keeps a file on everybody else and all of their little sins, so that he can report them yeah, to to the, uh, to the authorities mm-hmm. and thereby yeah. uh, climb the ranks. And he has no sense of humor. Yeah. He has no sense of culture. He has no sense of of anything being fine or beautiful. He only keeps his little notepad and and. Uh, Makes sure that every everyone is doing everything according to all the little rules. Yes, so yes, it's a heron. Yeah, there's that's, that's a great scene in the book. Uh, and would you like some wine to go with your stew? Says says the bishop, and uh, and the he the people don't know what to order, and so the bishop says perhaps the I don't know how to pronounce this the Royha. I'll, I'll say uh, the Royha. <laughs> now there was a wine that would clash with the stew as Achilles clashed with Hector. It would slay the dish with a blow to the head and drag it behind its chariot until it tested the fortitude of every man in Troy. Besides, it plainly cost three times what the young man could afford. With a shake of the head, the count reflected that there was simply no substitute for experience. 
Here had been an ideal opportunity for a waiter to fulfill his purpose. By recommending a suitable wine, he could have put a young man at ease, perfected a meal, and furthered the cause of romance all in a stroke. But whether from a lack of subtlety or a lack of sense, the bishop had, had not only failed in his purpose, he had put his customer in a corner. So the count, as she says, goes over and suggests a completely different wine, and that that would go much better with the stew, the the uh, a Georgian stew that they were eating. And just as he suspected, it was the perfect dish for the season. The onions thoroughly caramelized, and this this, this bottle of of Mukuzani uh, was the perfect complement to this. And this is this food issue. Obviously, it's a big theme in the book because he's eating at the restaurant every day and the cook's one of the troika. So how is this related to the the preservation of civilization? Well, because uh, there's this picture of civilization that's presented throughout the book where there's this enjoyment of all of these fine things in life, these small, fine, little things that don't need to be expensive. Mm -hmm. they, they don't require you to be a snob. You know, uh, one example is he he makes friends with the janitor in the hotel who spends nights up on the on the roof enjoying the the night sky and the janitor makes this this black bread and homemade honey. So it's simple mm -hmm. fare, but there's this enjoyment there of the uh, what what Russell Kirk calls the proliferating variety of human life, all of these little things of of culture, uh, and I, I want I want to draw a link to uh, Willa Cather's uh, "Death Comes for the Archbishop." Mm -hmm. There's this wonderful scene, uh, and I'm t stealing this point from uh, Joseph Epstein's. Uh, uh, essay, the He's ideal a good person of, to steal of from, right? culture. Yes, indeed. Uh, one of my favorite authors. Um, where So you, you have uh, the Bishop Latour and uh, a priest, and the, the priest makes this, uh, this soup, this French soup with, with croutons and whatnot. And the, the bishop takes a, a sip and he says, mm, only you could, could make this uh, soup. And the, the priest says, if... Uh, uh, it's because I'm a Frenchman. And the bishop pauses for a second and says, well, no offense to your individual skill, but it's true that this soup could only be made after a thousand years of civilization. And if you just reflect on that, all the little things that go into a soup, the and, and making of croutons and the making of the specific kind of bread that makes those croutons and the way that it combines with the onions and the soup and the spices and the whole process of doing it, uh, it's, it's built layer upon layer. And it's these, these little points of joy that ennoble ennoble life. And th that, that to me is the character of the count. That he is, that's what makes him a civilized gentleman is that he knows how to extract from the smallest things their maximum value and appreciate uh, the, the culture behind them. And as you say, it's not the most expensive things necessarily. Right. There's one scene and, you know, because. Well, because he recommends that wine. Yeah, he recommends wine. Part of and, the recommendation is that it's. Right. The cheaper and, wine. and earlier than that, uh, he's. he's he is uh, sort of complimenting Emil, the cook, because there are shortages of certain things, certain spices you can't get. And yet, even without those, Emil knows so much about what goes with what and what the right spice is that he replaces uh, either basil or oregano, He uh, the count's not sure, with nettle. And, and there's a scene where he's asking the waiter, uh, I do have one question. The herb that Emil has tucked under the ham, I know it isn't sage. By any chance, is it nettle? And he himself uh -huh. is <laughs> cultured enough to know uh -huh. the actual spice that's being used. And it's something that you find by the roadside and is usually something you don't even want to touch because it hurts. Uh, uh -huh. Nettles, I've had that problem. Uh, <laughs> so so he, he he's able to accurately predict. Mm -hmm. He comes back and 
at this point, he doesn't know the chef yet. And the chef is just impressed that he knows what spice <laughs> is being used here. And again, it's it's a nettle. It's a weed that, that nobody uh-huh. would pay any attention to. And somehow the cook, because he's cultured in his own way in terms of the cooking mm-hmm. world. Knows how to make the most of yes, what you have. What That's part has. of being cultured, too. Yes, yeah. right. We'll be back in a moment. The purpose of the Memoria College Master's Program in the Classics is to enable teachers, school administrators, and students to enter the great discussion, the conversation about truth, goodness, and beauty that's been going on in the Western world for over 2,000 years. We do this by reading the great books, talking about them, and writing about them. Our tutors help students to encounter the great classics of theology, philosophy, literature, ethics, political theory, law, and science. There's a lot you can do with great teachers and great books. But you can do even more when you also have great students, and we do. And I have said this, and I've told my students, that I've been teaching at our undergraduate level for almost 20 years, um, and my Memorial College students are the best students I've ever taught. They're on fire for classical education, uh, and they want to learn, and they're very smart, and the collaborative discussion was just out of this world, and I felt as if I was um, being taught as much as I was teaching. Our liberal arts curriculum may strike many people as absolutely insane. These great books won't necessarily help you get a better job. So this might leave you wondering what the point of all this reading is. So what are the liberal arts for? Most fundamentally, they're for themselves. They're for your capacity to communicate effectively and clearly. They're for your decision making. They're for your character and your growth. Let's face it, we only have so much time in our busy modern lives. We need to make sure we keep in mind Thomas Aquinas' great admonition. The slightest knowledge of the greatest things is greater than the greatest knowledge of the slightest things. In other words, we need to make our time count. To learn to love language, to be steeped in history by sound reading and long conversation, to compose a sentence worthy of remembering, to do all this is to cast off, I think, the blinders of self, to leave Plato's cave, and to accustom our eyes to a light that blinds, but once our spiritual eyes adjust, can elevate and ennoble. Memoria College. Great books, great teachers, great students. Welcome back to our discussion of Gentlemen in Moscow. Uh, I'm Martin Cothran with my colleague Dan Scheffler. So we have we have a meal and we have uh Andre the the maitre d and we have uh the bishop so we've got our our characters sort of lined up here and the bishop becomes more and more problematic as this story as he goes grows along. in power as, yes uh-huh. as he gain as he gains power and so because he's working for the party in some capacity it's never exactly clear what it is he's doing. And another related to food is wine. Mm -hmm. Wine plays a part all through this, this story as Mm -hmm. in in the same way, I think that the food does. It's another sort of metaphorical representation of culture. Uh, How does that work in in the story in terms of wine? Well, so there, there's a, uh, a scene that, uh, just breaks my heart. <laughs> it's so devastating uh, because uh, the the count. So the count goes to or through his his regular routine to the restaurant, and uh, the bishop comes and asks what kind of wine he would like. This is still when the bishop is is a waiter, and uh, the um, the count responds with some particular wine, and the the, the bishop says. Uh, no, we only have red or white. And he's flabbergasted. And he, he comes to find out that they have removed, the Soviets have come in and removed all the labels on the whole storehouse of wine, you know, which is one of the finest storehouses in Russia. Right. He's, I'm, look, I'm looking at the text here. He says, uh, will you be having wine? And Rostov says, absolutely, a bottle of San Lorenzo Barolo, 1912. And the bishop says, will you be having red or white? Well, of course, this is 
this is a scandal to a person who knows wine because it's not just that it's red or white. There's all kinds of subtleties to wines. There's all kinds of different reds. There's all kinds of different whites. And each one goes with a certain meal. And uh, and so, so Rostov protest, protests this. A Barolo, the Count explained as helpfully as he could, is a full-bodied red from northern Italy. <laughs> as such, it is the perfect accompaniment to the Osso Buco of Milan, which he's having, uh, which he just has, has ordered. And uh, the bishop says, I apologize if I'm not being clear, but for your selection of wine tonight, there are only two options, white and red. So, so then it, Rostov cannot believe this. This is part of his whole life that he, uh-huh. that he and his, his, his cultured attitude toward everything. So he goes and gets Andre and says, what's going on here? And Andre says, come with me. And they go down to the wine cellar. And as you say, here are... I don't know how many thousands of bottles of wine, all with their labels taken off. What is the symbolism there? Is there, is there something we can take out of it? Because I think this is, I think this is the greatest scene in the book. I think it's the most evocative of all the scenes in terms of, I think, what he's trying to communicate here about the way that this leveling philosophy uh-huh. of communism where everybody and everything has to be the same. There is no, uh-huh. there may be an order of some kind, but it's not a hierarchy. Uh-huh. There's not a hierarchy of the beautiful to the ugly, the good, the evil, the true to the, it's, it's, it's just there. These bottles of wine are just there. Uh-huh. And they're, all you can tell about them is that they're reds or whites. What does that say? Well, and and I, I, I think it back to the Scruton comment that, Stupidity can come along and destroy <laughs> everything of beauty in just in just a moment uh, because they have the power. Uh, and I, I think you're right. I think it's symbolic of uh, that egalitarian leveling philosophy that says, well, because. Some things have distinction, and some things uh, are, are better than others. Well, we can't have that. Uh, that that's pride and arrogance and injustice. So we have to level it all and take away the distinctions. Yeah, Andre says to him, "A complaint was filed with Comrade Theodorov, the Commissar of Food, claiming that the existence of our wine list runs counter to the ideals of the revolution." This this is the communist attitude. I don't want to get political here, but don't we see the same leveling tendency in our own culture mm. and more of it all the time? I don't think you have to get too political because I think we see it in both parties. Yeah. You oh, know, yeah. and and yeah. we we see uh, I, I encounter this this attitude in in you name it. It's it's not just on one side or the other. Uh but but people thinking that uh lest we have one person better than another, mm-hmm. lest we have one thing better mm-hmm. than another, we have to bring everything down to right. the lowest common denominator. And if all we have is a color to denominate any kind of difference, there's just only uh-huh. there's just one basic difference. But but Rostov is a cultured man. He can know he knows the difference between different kinds of reds and he knows the difference between the different kinds of whites. And so there's at the end of that scene they're they're still in the, the wine cellar. And uh uh, Andre says, wait a minute. And so he says, the count began walking the cellar's center aisle, much as a commander and his lieutenant might walk through a field hospital in the aftermath of a battle, what he compares uh-huh. that to. Near the end of the aisle, the count turned down one of the rows. With a quick accounting of columns and shelves, the count determined that in this row alone, there were over a thousand bottles. A thousand bottles virtually identical in shape and weight. Picking up one at random, he reflected how perfectly the curve of the glass fit in the palm of the hand, how perfectly its volume weighed upon the arm. But inside, inside this dark green glass, what was what exactly? A Chardonnay to complement a Camembert? A Sauvignon Blanc to go with some Chevre? Whichever wine was within, it was decidedly not identical to its neighbor's. On the contrary, the context of the bottle, contents of the bottle in his hand was the product of a history as unique and complex as that of a nation or a man. 
In its color, aroma, and taste, it would certainly express the idiosyncratic geology and prevailing climate of its home, home terrain. I have a friend of mine who's not a sommelier because he says he can't tell what year the wine is. But if, you, if he tastes it, he said, I can tell you where it's from. Uh, and he's got this uh, great story about how he was staying at a New Zealand hotel and they brought him out that, that claimed only to serve New Zealand wine. And so they brought this wine out and, and he tasted and said, told the waitress, uh, this is not a New Zealand wine. And she said, what do you mean? You're absolutely it is. It's all we serve. And so she he said, well, it's, it's good wine, but it's not from Australia, uh, not from New Zealand. So she goes back in 10 minutes. She, Later, she comes back, and she's holding this bottle of Australian wine. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, I don't want to forget one important part. Meanwhile, he's told his wife, not only is, is it Australian, it's from uh, the McLaren Vale. And so she brings the, the Australian wine. She says, I'm so sorry, sir. This got mixed in with our wine, and I accidentally <laughs> gave you Australian wine. I'm so sorry. And he said, could I see the label real, real, real quick? So he grabs the bottle and looks, and it says McLaren Vale, and he shows it to his wife. And she says, I'm never going to hear the end of the Sam. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, you know, you you actually can taste those differences. Uh-huh. Th- those are, and, and some people can, can even tell you the year. All right. And this is the nature of human beings, of mm-hmm. human life, that we're not all the same. And cultures are not all the same. Mm-hmm. Places are not all the same. And we should celebrate and preserve mm-hmm. th- those distinctions. Mm-hmm. It's not, uh, it, it's not anti- uh, egalitarian to do yes. so. And he's, he points out, as we age, we are bound to find comfort from the notion that it takes generations for a way of life to fade. We are familiar with the songs our grandparents favored, after all, even though we never danced to them ourselves. At festive holidays, the recipes we pull from the drawer are routinely decades old, and in some cases even written in the hands of a relative long since dead. And the objects in our homes the oriental coffee tables and well-worn desks that have been handed down from generation to generation. Despite being out of fashion, not only do they add beauty to our daily lives and lend material credibility to our presumption that the passing of an era will be glacial. Um, and there's a particular wine he likes. Uh, you, you, you pronounced it earlier because I don't know the Chateau Neuf de Pop? Yes, Ch- Chateau Neuf de Pop. Um, I always say, because I don't know how to speak French, so I my only rule is just plug your nose and mispronounce <laughs> the word. But, uh, yes, yeah, so we've got this wine. And he so us, cultured of you. Yes. So on his way out, he says, wait a minute. And he goes back and he feels the oh. bottles. And he finds a bottle that has a, a, an actual sort of logo imprinted on the mm. glass mm-hmm. itself. It's the keys of yes, Peter. And, and my yeah, the keys of Peter. And my wife has bought me a, a, a bottle of this. Uh, how do you pronounce it again? Chateau Neuf de Pop. The very good, thank you. Uh, <laughs> she bought me, a, and it's it's there in the glass. And so he grabs this one. There's some kind of symbolism going on there. What is what is what does that scene say? That he's able to find this bottle when it's actually imprinted on the glass. Right. So they, I, I think part of it is that there are uh, some distinctions that even when uh, they come and try to level everything, mm-hmm. there are some things that are so ingrained, ingrained mm-hmm. and uh, important that they bear that mark. They can't, the revolutionaries can't ultimately erase. Uh, everything mm-hmm. uh, in in culture, yeah. and and he comes along and is able to, b- with the right knowledge, retrieve that that otherwise might be just lost in in the heap. And of course, it's part of the story. I don't want to ruin too much of it, but the the Chateau Neuf de Pop is means something to him personally, uh, and he has a ritual that he he does every year with. With this, so it's important to him to preserve that special wine and bring it out from the rest. He says here, I think um, this was in a bit that you you skipped. He says, "Yes, a bottle of wine was the ultimate distillation of time and place, a poetic expression of individuality itself. Yet here it was cast back into the sea of anonymity, that realm of averages mm-hmm. and unknowns." Right. But in the sixth row, he came to a stop. 
Reaching down to a shelf at the height of his knee, the Count carefully took a bottle from among the thousands. Holding it up with a wistful smile, he ran his thumb over the insignia of the two crossed keys that was embossed on the glass. Yeah, I love that. Also, you mentioned the, the word ritual. Uh-huh. What role does ritual play in this preservation of civilization? Well, it, it, it's a way that he is able to keep his sanity through all of these years in the hotel, there's all these wonderful little scenes where it meditates on the rituals that he has. He wakes up and he does a little exercise mm-hmm. routine mm-hmm. and his his rituals of greeting uh, certain of the staff members as he goes through his, his day at a certain place and time. Uh, he has a ritual of reading, of tilting his his chair back mm-hmm. while while he reads in his And what is he, room. There, there's a book that, uh, he reads in this story, and it's mentioned again and again throughout the story. What is it? Montaigne's essays? Why is that? Um, I, you know, th- this I've, I've pondered this with the significance of Montaigne's essays, um, and I can't quite figure it out. Partly because he doesn't finish the essays, and he doesn't particularly like them. His father held the essays in high regard. And so it's one of the books that he brought with him and he thinks that he should should read mm-hmm. it. And he keeps kind of coming back to it throughout the story, but he doesn't actually like them particularly. But it's one of the books that we cover in Memoria College's the, Great Books program. Yeah. And so if you would like to know more. <laughs> yes, right. uh, I'll be given the, 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 the plug at the end of it. Uh, the, the, yeah, I just sort of assumed maybe that it was because Montaigne seems to have this this interest in everything. Mm. He write he writes essays uh-huh. on every possible subject and sort of is a personal exemplar of how western civilization has this universal outlook this inquisitiveness about mm-hmm. everything. In a way in a way Montaigne seems to right. be the exemplar of of one of the strongest impulses. That was my first inclination was to think that Montaigne was a representative of of the kind of ideals in in this book. Uh, you know, I tell my my students when I teach Montaigne that Montaigne is probably the most civilized man mm-hmm. on our well, reading go, list. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to go too far into Montaigne's biography, yeah. but he's he's really a remarkable person. The thing that made me hesitate was this fact that. He 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 doesn't quite like it. There's kind of a negative reaction to Montaigne, and I I don't I don't. It would it would be another thing if Montaigne was held up by Rostov as well, something yeah. that he reads and really admires, mm-hmm. and you know embodies his his philosophy of life. But it, it doesn't have that. Does, does he dislike place. it or just not like it? I mean, it, you know, there's things that you read that you don't like uh, all that uh, much, and yet you're glad you have read them. Mm-hmm. And I wondered if maybe that was Montaigne for him or whether he really just had an active dislike. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't quite know what to make of it. Well, there's this great scene in here where they're at the Chalupin, which I, I take it to be a bar, uh-huh. the, the bar of the hotel. And there is a, uh, there's a conversation going on between a Brit, somebody from England, and a German traveler and to, to, for whom travel had obviously lost all its charm charms, it says. And so they're drinking vodka and they, uh, he, he hears one of them say that there's nothing really great about Russian culture. And so this, of course, is, is, a, is a challenge to Rostov. He's not a part of the conversation as of yet, but he intervenes. And uh, he, he says, I will buy a glass of vodka for any man in this bar. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. This is the German. The German gave his younger neighbor the look of one who had no experience uh, being anything but serious because he had he had challenged his low view of Russian culture. Uh, so I will buy a glass of vodka, he said, for any man in this bar who can name three more uh, uh, three more great things about Russia than vodka. So... Uh, it says, now, vodka was not on the Count's preferred list. In point of fact, despite his love for his country, he rarely drank it. But when man's country is dismissed so offhandedly, <laughs> he cannot hide behind his preferences or his appointments, especially when he has drunk a bottle of white and a snifter of brandy. 
So having sketched a quick instruction for Audrey to sit the back of a napkin and tucked it under a one-ruble note, the count cleared his throat. And here's what he says. Excuse me, gentlemen. I couldn't help but overhear your exchange. I have no doubt, mine hair, that your remark regarding Russia's contribution to the West was a form of inverted hyperbole, an exaggerated diminution of the facts for poetic effect. Nonetheless, I will take you at your word and happily accept your challenge. And, and uh, so the Brit is amazed by this. But I do have one condition, added the count. And what is that? Asked the German. That for each of the contributions I name, we three shall drink a glass of vodka together. <laughs> and so he gives three things which he thinks are things that set Russia apart in terms of its culture. Number one, said the count, adding a pause for dramatic effect, Chekhov and Tolstoy. Now, I, uh, I remember there's a book called The Politically Incorrect Guide to, Brit to, English and American, to British and American Literature. Elizabeth Cantor wrote that. It's a great little book, actually. And she says, you know, English rules in every literary genre, except for the novel, where the Russians rule. <laughs> and so Tolstoy and Dostoevsky would be, are, are the two great... Russian authors uh, puts Chekhov in there, and I think Chekhov you could put in uh -huh. that company easily. So the German let out a grunt because he knew <laughs> that that was an unchallengeable assertion. Really, number two, um, Act One, Scene One of the Nutcracker. Tchaikovsky, the German fraud. <laughs> you laugh, mine here, and yet I would wager a thousand crowns that you can picture it. Picture it yourself. On Christmas Eve, having celebrated with family and friends in a room dressed with garlands, Clara sleeps soundly on the floor with her magnificent new toy. But at the stroke of midnight, with the one-eyed Drosselmeyer perched on the grandfather clock like an owl, the Christmas tree begins to grow. And he just evokes this, uh -huh. this, this scene from The Nutcracker. Um, and then uh, the story was written in Prussian, <laughs> said the German, as he begrudgingly lifted his drink. I grant you that, conceded the count. And but for Tchaikovsky, it would have remained in Prussia. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third thing, he says. In lieu of an explanation, he simply gestured to the Shalyapin's entrance where a waiter suddenly appeared with a silver platter balanced on the palm of, the, of his hand. Placing the platter on the bar between the two foreigners, he lifted the dome to reveal a generous serving of caviar, accompanied by blini and sour cream. Even the German could not help but smile, his appetite getting better, getting the better of his prejudices. <laughs> so he was able to demonstrate there in this, in this barroom bed, essentially, that, uh, that Russia could not be dismissed as, as, uh, as, as a country whose only thing it could commend itself to the world with was vodka. Uh -huh. right. um, and we've been talking earlier, and you, you mentioned a, uh, a sh uh, short story, I believe it was, uh -huh. by by uh, Chekhov called right. The Bet. Right, right. I was, it, it, um, it, it's a great parallel mm -hmm. to this book because in The Bet, uh, it's two young men who have, who make this youthful bet uh, amongst themselves, uh, these aristocrats, uh, where uh, the, the one says, I don't think that you can stay in a room and not go out uh, carousing and and whatnot, and the other guy says, "Oh yeah, I want to bet," you know, and so they make this bet that uh, one of them is going to stay in the other's garden house, basically a single room, little uh, off building, uh, for I, I think it's twenty years, um, and if he can make it for twenty years, then he will inherit the whole fortune of of his friend. Uh, and he can have anything brought to him in that room that he requests, uh, but he just can't leave the premises, which is a very similar sort of setup to, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to this, this novel. So uh, the young man has at first you know, luxurious food brought to him and uh, you know, wine and all of this. Um, 
But as he goes, he requests books and he starts reading and he starts expanding his mind and his his tastes and then he has musical instruments yes, he brought yeah. to him and and he gets more sophisticated and then he has spiritual literature brought to him and he starts to deepen and at for a certain time he has o- he has only the new testament and he's sitting in the room for an extended period of time with only the new testament just reflecting uh and i won't ruin the the <laughs> plot twist but the you the, the idea is that um culture can be present because of uh, it's being transmitted in books and in instruments and in our food and in mm-hmm. all of this uh even if you are in a prison cell mm-hmm. you know even if you are confined to yes the metropole yes. hotel and it's it, it's a uh, it reads like a twilight zone episode and in uh, fact, there is a Twilight Zone episode that's similar oh, really? to that. Yeah, slightly changed, but it's very, very similar <laughs> to that. Um, yes, and and uh, and so in that case, it's 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 a little bit almost a self-imposed exile, right? Because he's, he's made a bet, right? But there's this uh, passage in in Gentleman in Moscow, where he says, "As long as there have been men on Earth," reflected the count, "there have been men in exile." From primitive tribes to the most advanced societies, someone has occasionally been told by his fellow men to pack his bags, cross the border, and never set foot on his native soil again. But perhaps this was to be, was to be expected. After all, exile was the punishment that God meted out to Adam in the very first chapter of the human comedy, and that he meted out to Cain a few pages later. Yes, exile was as old as mankind. But the Russians were the first people to master the notion of sending a man into exile at home. What is he saying there? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's a, a wry comment from a, a Russian count yeah. upon and, his own Yeah, culture. and then he, then he adds, as early as the 18th century, the Tsars stopped kicking their enemies out of the country, opting instead to send them to Siberia. Uh-huh. So you have the whole gulag system that was developed under the Soviets. Why? Because they had determined that to exile a man from Russia, as God had exiled Adam and Eve, was insufficient as a punishment. For in another country, a man might immerse himself in his labors, build a house, raise a family, that is, he might begin his life anew. But when you exile a man into his own country, there is no beginning anew. Uh So... Right. Uh, and well, and this, this, that's actually a good segue to something that we probably should have mentioned l- long before in, in the episode and laying out the, uh, the plot of the book, because in a way, the Count is able to start anew and mm-hmm. to start a family because he has this uh, ongoing uh, interaction first with uh, a young girl named. Nina, uh, that he meets right in the beginning of the book. Who has this penchant for wearing yellow. A penchant for wearing yellow and for getting into trouble and for exploring all the nooks and crannies of the hotel. She somehow lands a key. She finds a key and can can, uh, get into all the rooms Mm -hmm. and and whatnot. Um, And so through his relationship uh, to sort of running around with with Nina in Mm -hmm. in the hotel, um, he becomes friends with her, and she grows up, and um, we can talk about that if you want. But uh, through a sequence of events, she ends up uh, arrested. Her husband is ends up arrested uh, by the Soviets, and she goes off to look for him and leaves her daughter, Sophia, with the Count, uh, and um, they never he never hears from from Nina. Again, and so he now has to become the surrogate father, effectively for mm-hmm. Sophia, and that occupies the whole second half of the novel. And so he he, he it becomes a father, yes, and experiences that that uh, self giving love mm-hmm. and care mm-hmm. for another mm-hmm. human being, and that gives a meaning to his life that it wouldn't have had if he were just this isolated It's a really beautiful bachelor. relationship, and uh, I'm glad you made that point about this sort of selfless love. He, he gives up things for her. Uh-huh. Um, and in the end, you know, again, not to spoil the ending, but but there, the end very much involves her. 
And, um, and so, so I think that is a, a great thing. And he's, he's not, he's unmarried himself. He will never have a family. And yet he mm-hmm. gains one in, this in spite economy. of himself. In, in spite of ways. himself. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he didn't want it. He would. And he says at one point, you know, the inconveniences of life have been far more enriching than the conveniences of life. And she was very much an inconvenience. I mean, uh-huh. here's a ch- child just landing. Plopped right on him. Yeah. Yeah. And he just, you know, he, he, he embraces it and, and he becomes her father in every way, but, but genetically. So that is a very beautiful relationship. Um, and then Nina, uh, who, and the reason she never returns, is made fairly clear in the book that she has gone where her husband has gone, which is to force the kulaks, which were the, the sort of the heads of the peasantry mm-hmm. who ran the, the farms in Russia. They were, they were a sort of a peasant nobility, if you will. And Stalin, the, the, the event that's referred to here in the book, Stalin has decided that he's going to collectivize the farms. He's going to make them into socialist entities serving the state. And Stalin does this intentionally. He knows that he's got to kill off the kulaks. It's the only way he's going to do it. And he forces a famine that ends up killing millions and millions of people. Malcolm Muggeridge writes about that in a book called Winter in Moscow. And Muggeridge was a liberal journalist until he saw what the Soviets did to, to the people. They forced a famine. And part of that was going on in Ukraine, which is an, an issue right now in, in the news as we're sitting here. Um, there's, also, there's also, several times this is mentioned, the apple trees that he, he remembers from home. What is it about the apple trees? And there's a, there's a later scene where the apple trees, the apples come back in a strange way. Uh-huh. I think it's this recurring symbol throughout the yes. the story of that calling of home, uh, a certain kind of mm-hmm. of nostalgia that he has for that that estate, for everything that's been lost. the 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 family mansion has been burned down, mm-hmm. uh, but there's that smell that that lingers of the apple trees and the memories of a happy childhood in Nizhny Novograd. And uh, there's this longing for going back. It's a little bit like the Odyssey, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. and Odysseus wants to get home, Mm -hmm. you know, and and that's a great human story, Mm -hmm. (laughs) great human longing that keeps recurring in literature. And how does this come back to him? Somehow the apples make their way back to him in a strange way. Well, we've also we've already mentioned his friendship with the uh, the janitor mm-hmm. uh, and and his times on the in the evening on the roof of the hotel eating black bread and honey and he yeah. smells the and tastes the the various flowers that the the bees gather and it's mentioned that sometimes they f- fly rather far away to gather their mm-hmm. their pollen and in a particular scene he tastes the honey. And he tastes the smell of those apple blossoms in the honey. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's uh, Abram is the handyman's name. Um, and he, he, he tells, he, he tells uh, uh, Rostov, he says, they've returned. And Rostov said, the bees? Because they had left. They had left at one point in time. He had tasted the honey from these bees and they had, uh, they had t- it tasted like lilacs because that's what they were getting their pollen from. Well, then they come back after a period of time. They come back, he, uh, and, and Rostov says, "The bees, yes, that is that is not all, sir. Uh, sit, sit." He cut into the comb with a knife, spread the honey on a spoon, and handed it to the count. Then he stood back with a smile of anticipation. Well, he prompted, "Go ahead." Dutifully, the count put the spoon in his mouth. In an instant, there was the familiar familiar sweetness of fresh honey, sunlit, golden, and gay. Given the time of year, the Count was expecting this first impression to be followed by a hint of lilacs from the Alexander Gardens or cherry blossoms from the Garden Ring. But as the elixir dissolved on his tongue, the Count became aware of something else entirely. Rather than the flowering trees of central Moscow, the honey had a hint of a grassy riverbank, the trace of a summer breeze, a suggestion of pergola, but most of all, there was the unmistakable essence of a thousand apple trees 
in bloom. Here was home come, kind of come to him again. Right. Um, so I thought that was an interesting symbol used, used throughout uh-huh. this, this book. Now, uh, finally, um, there is this relationship that develops about half, starts to develop about halfway through the book with an official. Uh, let's discuss that a little bit. What awesome. We, awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there, the, this Soviet official who wants some intelligence <laughs> on uh, American culture, and he wants to understand how Americans think, and uh, he also wants to understand how European aristocrats think and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. And it starts uh, very much an adversarial thing. Mm-hmm. And so he commissions Rostov to, and almost forces him to advise on uh, American culture and uh, European culture right. and just Well, at the, first, the, he wants them to best basically uh, to teach him the languages, like English uh, and French. He wanted right. Rostov. And how to, how to dine and, yes, and yes. where to, you know, how to pick up the, uh, the fork and, and all of that. Okay. But it gets to watching movies. Which he, why? What? Uh, at first, as a way of uh, learning about uh, the American culture. Um, but it, it becomes very clear that Osip loves the movies. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and enjoys watching uh, these these films. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they're watching uh, they're watching movies like A Day at the Races, which is a Marx <laughs> Brothers movie. I don't know what that says about America. I'm scared to think about it. Um, <laughs> it, it says also that I actually mastered the English language right down to the past perfect progressive as early as 1939. Some of our uh, people who studied Latin will know what that means. But the American movies still deserve their careful consideration, he argued, not simply as windows into Western culture, but it's unprecedented mechanisms of class repression. That's his, that's his initial uh, <laughs> line, right? For with cinema, the Yanks had apparently discovered how to placate the entire working class at the cost of a nickel a week. This is, this is his view of American movies. And he says, he says, just look at their depression. From beginning to end, it lasted 10 years, an entire decade in which the proletariat was left to fend for itself, scrounging in alleys and begging at chapel doors. If ever there had been a time for the American worker to cast off the yoke, surely that was it. But did they join their brothers in arms? Did they shoulder their axes and splinter the doors of the mansions? Not even for an afternoon. Instead, they shoveled to the nearest movie house, where the latest fantasy was dangled before them like a pocket watch at the end of a chain. It was almost hypnotizing, he seems to suggest. Yes, Alexander, it behooves us to study this phenomenon with the utmost diligence and care. That's his, that's his line, that this is an opiate of the masses, uh-huh. that the movies are an opiate of the masses. And he goes on and he, 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 he analyzes the different genres of American movies. And the Count could confirm that Ossip approached the task with the utmost diligence and care. For when a movie was playing, he could hardly, hardly sit still. During the Westerns, when a fight broke out in a saloon, he would clench his fist, <laughs> fend off a blow, give him a left to the gut, and an uppercut to the jaw. When Fyodor Astaire, as he called him, uh, Fyodor Astaire, Fred, <laughs> danced with Ginger Rogers, Ginger, G-I-N-G-Y-R, uh, Rogers, his fingers would open wide and flutter about his waist while his feet shuffled back and forth on the carpet. And when Bella Lugosi emerged from the shadows, Ossip left from his leapt from his seat and nearly <laughs> fell to the floor. <laughs> Shameful, he would say. Scandalous, insidious. <laughs> and then he goes, and he's he's talking about all the different kinds of movies and what they do, what their role is in oppressing the masses. But then he gets to film noir, and he can't understand it. What's his problem with film noir? I, I, I... It, it's, it, he, he, he says, uh, Ossip would dissect whatever they, he had just discovered. The musicals were pastries designed to placate the impoverished with daydreams of unattainable bliss. Horror movies were sleights of hand in which the fears of the working man had been displaced by those of pretty girls. The vaudevillian comedies were preposterous narcotics. And the westerns, they were the most devious propaganda of all. I love, <laughs> I love this because I think that's right from that perspective because I, I, I really think that the Western was the epic uh-huh. 
of America. I mean, I mean the 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 the, the Greeks had Homer. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey to tell them what their va- their values and ideals were. And we have Louis L'Amour. And we have Louis L'Amour. It's it's all it's exactly right. <laughs> uh, you know my my love for Louis L'Amour. Um, Hollywood is the single most dangerous force in the history of class struggle, he says. Or so Ossip argued until he discovered film noir. With rapt attention, he watched the likes mm. of This Gun for Hire, excellent. Shadow of a Doubt, another excellent Hitchcock. Double Indemnity. What is this, he would ask of no one in particular. Who is making these movies? Under what auspices? It was the one genre of American film which was not an opiate of the masses. Uh-huh. From one to the next, they seemed to depict an America in which the, in which corruption and cruelty lounged on the couch, in which justice was a beggar and kindness a fool, in which loyalties were fashioned from paper and self-interest was fashioned from steel. In other words... They provided an unflinching portrayal of capitalism as it actually was. How did this happen, Alexander? Why do they allow these movies to be made? Do they not realize they are hammering a wedge between beneath their own foundation stones? But this is the thing I think that Ossip doesn't see is that we are able in our freedom to critique ourselves. Uh-huh. And that's really a release right. valve. You don't have to oppress people. You don't have to make them toe the party line. You you take into account what the problems are in your own culture. Western civilization has always done this. Right. We've always been self-critical, and we've been allowed to be self-critical uh, by our leaders, whereas this would not be allowed in the Soviet Union. Right. Right? Right. Yeah. So, and then there's a, um, <clears throat> there's one film noir that he doesn't like. I, I don't Casablanca. Remember, we were talking Casablanca, about, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. We were talking about this before. Casablanca, he does not he calls it a woman's movie. Oh, right. <laughs> and and so so later on in the story, and you really have to, I think, have seen Casablanca. So anyone uh, reading this book, you see Casablanca first. Because the latter part of this, again, we're trying not to give away the the, the <laughs> ending, but the ending has very much to do with the movie Casablanca. There's expressions used in this little duel that goes on, friendly duel that goes on between Ossip and Rostov that mm-hmm. they're all references to Casablanca. So he, he, he at one point, he hasn't seen Ossip in a while. They, they kind of, they're not, they're not getting together and watching movies as much as they were. And so he calls me, he says, you need to see Casablanca. So they come and they watch Casablanca together. And Ossip admits, okay, I, I I agree with you. This is this is a really good movie. And that and the movie Casablanca casts a shadow, really, on the rest of the story uh, in the in in the end. And I I was I had read this book, and then I had seen uh I had seen a, a film noir. This was last year or the year before, called Nobody Lives Forever with John, uh, John Wait, not John Williams. I forget the actor's uh, name. He was, he was a popular actor and in a lot of uh, noirs at the time. And I watched that movie and it, it, watching that particular noir film really made me realize what a great genre film noir is. And then I went back and read this and I thought, this is so great that th- this is, I, when I read this through the first time, I wasn't paying too much attention to this part, but I started paying close attention uh-huh. to this part because, because noir really is one of the great genres and how he uses it in here, I think uh-huh. is, is really interesting. Really interesting. So, all right. So what is the theme of this book? Or, or is there more than one theme? I think, well, I think it's in the title, A Gentleman in Moscow. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I had to put it in one word, it would be gentleman. Mm-hmm. What does it mean to be a Gentlemen, right? Uh, and, and John Henry Newman talks about this in the in the book that was in our first episode, right? Uh, the the mind of Newman. a gentleman, the yeah. ideal uh, mm-hmm. education of a gentleman. And I think it's I, I, I'll, I have a passage here. Um, so there's the there's this clock that features in the story, uh, Rostov's mm-hmm. uh, clock from from his father, or, or uh, sorry, uh, um, yes, from from his father who. Um, specially commissioned this clock to only strike 
twice a day instead of every hour, mm -hmm. okay? It says, in the afternoon, the Count's father believed that a man should take care not to live by the watch in his waistcoat, marking the minutes as if the events of one's life were stations on a railway line. Rather, having been suitably industrious before lunch, he should spend his afternoon in wise liberty. That is, he should walk among the willows, read a timeless text, converse with a friend beneath the pergola, or reflect before the fire, engaging in those endeavors that have no appointed hour and that dictate their own beginnings and ends. So I think that that phrase, uh, spending the afternoon in wise liberty, is the essence of what it means to be a gentleman. Uh, having that that freedom, and in, in a certain way, Rostov is confined in the hotel, but also that makes his life free mm -hmm. because he can read whatever he wants and spend his day however he wants while he's in it, that hotel. Is, I, I, took, I took that as saying that we should not spend all our time in utilitarian pursuits. Right, exactly. All of our time engaging in the means to some end that we never actually enjoy. Exactly. That that there are certain things we need to do to prepare ourselves to actually enjoy those kinds of things. That's the time it, before lunch. That's the time before, before the first right. uh, ring but, of the bell. But, th but how many of us engage in the utilitarian means towards some end until our very end, and we never enjoy the things we were working for? Exactly. We work for— the time when we can sit on our porch at leisure and and read something that we really like or whatever whatever it is that we are really trying to work for and we 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 have this process we built up to get us there and all we ever engage in is the process right. of getting there we never stop and enjoy the the the, the, the ends the and, things and, that that you do for their own sake not for any other sake and I think we have the the opposite problem on the other end too, which is that people um, they work and they work and they work to so that they can finally get home mm -hmm. and enjoy their evening uh, or their weekend, or they work for sixty years so they can mm -hmm. save up enough so they can retire. And then what do they do with the freedom? Do they do they have a, a wise mm -hmm. liberty? Yeah. Or do they just kick back in their lazy boy and play some video games, yeah. uh, right. you know, or or drink a six pack of Bud Light? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, and the essence of being a gentleman for Rostov is that wise liberty of taking that the time, taking the freedom to enjoy that which is truly worth uh, appreciating, mm -hmm. whether it's the expensive Chateau Neuf du Pop mm -hmm. or whether it's the black bread made by the handyman. Right and and the honey collected right. from his his hives. There. Right, there's a Solzhenitsyn book, A Day in the Life of Ivan uh, Dasinovich, and he there's this there's this scene, and it, I think it's maybe repeated in the book, where he's given food, and of course he's in a slave labor camp in the Soviet Union, and so food is precious, and so when he eats. Solzhenitsyn makes this big deal about how he eats, which is he thinks of nothing else. He focuses exclusively on what he's eating, and he savors every bit of it. And, you know, just shoves everything out to the side. And, of course, our problem now is there's so many distractions that are don't not only don't get us further to any end— but aren't worth anything in and of themselves anyway. And we don't just, you know, we, I, and I feel this more and more as I get older is I need to just put everything aside and focus on the one good thing that I've been working for. <laughs> the, the kinds of things I want, I've said and thought all my life that I want to do when I have the time and opportunity. And, um, and I, I, I kind of take, take what he's saying there as, wow. as an example of that. Well, uh, we could talk a lot about a lot of things in this book. There's so much more in the book than what we've talked about. Um, this idea of a gentleman 
who is the exemplar in a way of his civilization. It's the kind of person we really want to produce through the means of a civilization, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I would say, you know, if you if you if you haven't read this book, uh, we we strongly recommend you read it. It's a I can think of very few books that are as profound as 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 this one. And so uh, we 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 highly recommend that to our to our listeners. Uh, we will, as I mentioned, be doing uh, another one of of Toll's books, uh, which is um, the Lincoln Highway. At some point soon, uh, a bunch of us here at the office have read it, and so we want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, anything more you want to add to, to what we talked about? I want to repeat what I said at the very beginning, which is that I just adore this this it's, book. It's a great and, little book. Uh, yeah, I wish everybody uh, reads it so that I can uh, talk about it with more people. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, I I in preparation for the podcast, I'd read this about a year ago, and so I had to go. I actually listened to it. I listened to a lot of books uh, on Audible.com, and um, and going back through it, I had forgotten some things. I had kind of forgotten about Ossip uh, ah. and what an interesting relationship he had. So many rich characters. So many rich yeah. characters. And I, I don't know how a writer does quite what Tolls does. I think he's very unique among modern writers. And, you know, a lot of books, I want to make, let me make this one point about this, is that that a, a lot of literature is modernist in, in ah. the sense that we're supposed to notice the technique that the author uh, used to do this book. And a lot of right. the books that we study in schools are this way because that gives you a lot to talk about. You know, right. you analyze how the author did certain things. And this book, the style is... It, and, how, and how much it conforms to the fashion of our time how much, by being yeah. disruptive yeah, it's to... Gotta be transgressive. Uh, it's got to be yeah. transgressive. And it's yeah. Gotta, yeah, yeah. He, he's, he's not writing revolutionary fiction. And in fact, in this book, he's writing fiction against revolution... In, in in a sense, uh -huh. right? He's talking about the Russian Revolution and a lot of things about the Russian Revolution, which are very similar to the revolutionary spirit that we see going on right now uh, in a lot of things. Um, but but it his technique is very much just straightforward narrative, and we were amazed by what he says, but and and by his style and how he says it. But there's there's no there, there's not a lot of of uh, of artistic techniques he's using to he's just a really good writer uh -huh. he just writes very very good straight ahead prose and so this is the kind of book i i wish we could see more of and in all of toll's books are this way uh they're they're a hearty amen to that yes and in those sort of those three three elements of any story you know the setting the plot and the character these are woven effortlessly uh -huh. together there's very few writers who can put on a bravura performance of all three of those things. Uh, and he, he really does it. So, well, thank you again for joining us to discuss another book worth reading. I'm Martin Cothran, provost for Memoria College, where we read the great books and a few really good ones as well, under great teachers with the extra added benefit of having some really great students who love all this as much as we do. Check us out at memoriacollege.org. Great books, great teachers, great students. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again.